That's smart. So, and what time is it uh, where you are? 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Okay, how? Uh, it's 10 p.m. Oh, okay, cool. So about seven hours difference. So how was your day so far? It's good. A lot of phone calls. Sun's coming out, so that's nice. I like to get outside whenever the sun's out because I do not like the cold. So it's a good day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sun, something that I miss a lot in the kind of <laughs> yeah. climate that I live. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, I... I need to thank you very much for accepting to come on this podcast. Happy to help. Love, I love chatting. And are you just getting started? Tell me about what you're trying to accomplish here. Yeah. So there are a lot of things to talk about and depending how much time you have, we are going to cover all of them. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin and carnivore are definitely going to be discussed. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. And something that else that I need to th uh, thank you for is uh, when I uh, messaged you on Instagram, you asked me, do you have a booking link? And it uh, kind of triggered this, this thought in me to find a booking app and it mm -hmm. made my life so easy. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> you go with Calendly? Yeah. Yeah. With yep. Calendly. Works, and, works perfect. Yeah. It's amazing. I didn't have to do any calculations. I, I am always... Uh, time stressed. zone right yeah you know, time zone calculate yeah that's huge yeah that's huge and i just give it my schedule and it figures out everything right uh, yeah awesome. and for the guys listening it is not a no paid pro promotion so it's just mm -hmm. <laughs> good app exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something that makes my uh made my life easier and i think i'm going to have a huge loads of podcasts in the future because it was very difficult to to arrange things right so let's start with uh with an introduction colin so uh please tell us about yourself or those the guys who don't know you please give us a brief this um description uh about a background about yourself that's that that would take a while so i'll try to summarize it to the best of my ability I would say I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was dropped out of college, I don't know, 15 years now. I started out as a professional poker player during the poker boom. That's when the World Series of Poker was on ESPN and, you know, it was like a big thing. And so I did that for a couple of years and that got me kind of my first step into entrepreneurship because you have to money, you have to manage your money, your schedule, your time, right? Like nobody's telling you to go play poker and nobody's telling you to quit when you're losing or stress or whatever, right? So it was like the perfect pregame for getting into the entrepreneurship game for sure. And then most of my education though was through entrepreneurship. My first business was a juice bar inside of an LA fitness. I actually used my entire poker bankroll to do that, to fund that. And then I brought some money from family too as well. And I did that for you know five or six years that paid for my lifestyle. Soon after starting that, we did a CrossFit and MMA gym. So I had two businesses. I was like 23 or four at the time. And I did both those for about six years and they both had relative success for what they were, small business. And they gave me, you know, the, the lifestyle of being able to kind of choose when I work, you know, work more on my business than in my business, hire employees, managers, et cetera. And so it gave me a kind of a fun lifestyle where I could do, you know, do exactly what I wanted when I wanted. And if I wanted to travel and leave and come back, I could do that as well. And then I wanted to just do something bigger. I just knew that like, it's great to help people get fit with the fit with CrossFit, with the gym, but I wanted to do something bigger because I looked at the world and like, there's a lot of unhealthy people out there that need help, you know, and the current environment isn't doing them any favors. And so that eventually led me to selling the gym, moving to Austin, packed up everything I had basically in a, my small car and then drove across the country with not a ton of money, actually, because I was kind of taking a hit to exit the way I did. And then I got here in Austin, Texas, and was like mulling around ideas. And then eventually one thing led to another. I started Wild Foods and that really took off. And that was like a bigger thing. And then since then, Again, it's like, what do I want to do next? Uh, Bitcoin, I'm really passionate about Bitcoin. How it can change the world? You know, health, it still matters. But uh, nowadays, I'm more just thinking about mindset, philosophy, and how to live a happy and healthy life. You know, because like the, re the reality is most people are not going to be millionaires or billionaires in their lifetime, and they don't have to want to be. Yet a lot of people believe they need to because they see social media and they see all these things and they think, oh, I got to do that or I don't exist or I don't matter or whatever. And that's completely and utterly ludicrous and it's backwards. The reality is a lot of people you see 
on TV, on social media, they have all this money or whatever. A lot of the, those people are not miserable. They're chasing things just as much as you are. They're trying to find happiness just as much as you are, right? And so I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I'm getting into writing more. And that is my long-winded intro. That was a good intro. So uh, it also brought up more que questions. Uh, how was your, sure. <laughs> your poker game? Because I didn't know about that. Uh, I went through your interviews podcasts and well uh, i follow your instagram uh, page very closely and that never came up so how did it yeah, go i don't talk and... about it i don't talk about it much you know <laughs> it is kind of the hidden secret i'm happy to ask you know answer your questions about that you know like it's very fascinating uh and yeah that entrepreneurship like it's the school of hard knocks you know you got to learn you learn by getting in the ring and really getting knocked around like versus for me, I didn't go to college. So I, it wasn't very like, I follow a professor, I follow this person or this advisor. They tell me what to do. They tell me what job to get, like whatever. It was kind of like go out into the real world, get knocked around a bunch, figure shit out and, you know, try to make something of your life. You know, I feel like it's the best way for a human to actually learn too. And did you play in person or did you play uh, behind the computer? Well, it was a combination. I mean, it started in person and anytime I could find games in person and, you know, I did the live casino thing for a while. There's like an Indian casino out in Florida and some dog tracks and stuff, but it was, it was a lot online. A lot of my success was online, you know, tournaments, cash games. Uh, you know, I was able to build my bankroll that over about a year and a half. And then I just got really stressed out because I mean, you go to work and you like lose $10,000 in a single session and you're like, man, this sucks. And then you got to show up the next day and you got to hope that doesn't happen again. And then you're trying to chase losses. And then like, it's a very, very hard thing to do. I'm sure a lot of like high end wall street traders where you're, you know, you're playing a game where you're winning and losing. Like there's probably a lot of parallels to that. Yeah. And it was just one of those things like, yeah, it's great. except my own schedule, but you still had to grind. You had to put in hours. I mean, like eight, 10 hours a day, sometimes uh, up a lot of late nights, you know, and I just wanted to do something else, something, something bigger. Right. So it was, it was a, it was a good education and it was a good, you know, like to teach me more about myself and mindset and thinking and things like that. And so I wouldn't trade for anything, but I knew I had to get out of it. And so that's where I went the entrepreneurship route after that. Mm -hmm. Did you get it out and get out of it because of this, the stress mostly? Yeah, the, the stress. And I probably, you know, had a sneaking suspicion that if I looked 10 years in the future, it's not what I wanted to be doing, mm -hmm. you know, like for whatever reason, I've always been propelled forward by some kind of bigger drive. Like I want to do big things. I want to have an impact. And I just felt like I'm playing a game for money with a lot of variance and gambling to it. It's not like, it's not gambling. It's a skill game, but there is variance, which is basically mathematical uncertainty, which means you have highs and lows and ups and downs, et cetera. And it just, I felt like it became a not good use of my life, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to spend my life just chasing this right? And dealing with this, whatever. I want to do something bigger. If I'm going to have stress, if I'm going to be worried about things, I want to be worried about big problems. Like I want to be worried about like massive problems that when I've solved them will impact the world in some way, you know, or, or actually matter rather than just like, oh, I made a little bit more money today versus today I didn't, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you wanted to make something tangible or better to say something that makes an impact on others' life. So not something that just... Uh, yeah. yeah. Build, I, want, I like building things. I'm a builder, right? So for sure. Mm -hmm. Right, and you also mentioned CrossFit and MMA, and another question came up. So many, this is really funny. Uh, so many um, people that I happen to follow and happen to agree with on so many things, they happen to be also uh, people who do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it I, those I, types. Uh -huh. So I just got curious. Uh, have you done any Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Yeah, a little bit. I, when we had the gym, we had this young guy, Kyle, that was kind of up and coming, super passionate about jujitsu. I mean, to this day, he's got his own school and like he lives and breathes it. And he was like hardcore getting into it. And so I did a few classes with him. I rolled around and whatever. I never, like at the time, I just couldn't find the time. I, I just, I didn't prioritize it enough. And even now it's on my radar to, I'm probably going to join this school here in South Austin and just kind of carve it into my schedule. Uh, it, it mm -hmm. is fascinating and amazing. I was more of a like traditional Taekwondo karate guy. And then that was like way before MMA was a thing. And then, you know, MMA has opened up more like Mu Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu are the two popular sport arts, but I've been a lifelong martial artist, you know, studied Bruce Lee, done all kinds of stuff. And it is, again, it's, it's another one of those things that, um, 
is for personal development, for self-development, for mindset, like it's just massive. So yeah, you do see a lot of people that are attracted to growth and development. They tend to also find hobbies that are hard, right? And that, that, that like challenges them mentally and physically. And so I'm the same way. I mean, CrossFit is brutal. At times when you're doing a workout, you like don't want to do this anymore. And so it was most of the time it was a mental battle more than a physical. And so, yeah, there's a lot of crossover there. And the type of people that are attracted to those things tend to, you know, end up thinking and seeing the world in similar ways. It's humbling and uh, ironically, in a kind of way, it is encouraging. It makes you be yourself more because you know how to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And you are also at the same time used to getting defeated because <laughs> yep. I have started just recently and what I'm experiencing is only defeat. Only one yes. win, which was with yep. a newcomer and yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. So let's go to Bitcoin. Uh, when did you get interested in, uh, interested in it? And what made you interested in Bitcoin first? What triggered you? What uh, motivated you to research it? Yeah. So early on, it was probably 2017 when I really, when I first got introduced. And I wasn't, you know, I, I was like, oh, this is cool cool thing. You know, I get it. I get how we need to kind of combine money and internet and connectivity. And like, maybe, maybe I knew a little bit about inflation. Maybe I knew a little bit about the problems of these things, but I, I wasn't really deep into that. Um, now since then it's changed a lot, but I would say 2017, I looked at my Coinbase records actually recently of my early purchases. I had bought two Bitcoin for around 600 a piece. And as you can imagine, you look at that and you're like, why didn't I buy, spend every penny and take loans out? You know, cause I, I could be a multimillionaire at this point, right? But whatever, you have those stories, you learn. Uh, and, it's, and that was probably what kind of got me interested. It's like, oh, this is going to go up, you know, number go up technology. And that's what brings people in. And that's what brought me in early on. It was more of an investment. It was more of like, this thing could be really big, but I had no idea how it could change the world. I had no idea the economic implications, the protection from inflation. Like none of these things were really on my radar. And then, so I kind of floated around like, oh, I had a little bit of Bitcoin. I just let it sit there. I don't pay much attention. And then I sold a little bit in 2019, I believe, and made a little bit of profit, reported that to the IRS, did all the stuff I'm supposed to do. And I shouldn't have because I would have much more Bitcoin right now if I didn't do that, right? Uh, it wasn't a substantial gain, but like if you buy a couple of Bitcoin at 700 and you know you sell it at like 10K um, and you make a little bit of profit, it's just like painful to think about how much more you would have right now, right? But whatever, that happened. Now in 2020, when all of the stuff going on in the world happened, like whether you call it on purpose, on accident, just whatever, I don't care what you label it, but a lot of craziness happened in 2020. That really woke me up to what was going on because that's when the government went crazy with their money printing, right? We went from like an M3 money supply or M2, I forgot the number of like, I think it was like, we were like 7 trillion and then a very, now we're at like 24. And like within, within two years, basically, we've literally quadrupled the money supply. Uh, and it's just insane. So I started looking at inflation I started looking into economics. Then I went into deep rabbit holes into like libertarianism, the state, like all these different things. Cause I never really cared about politics. And I got a little bit into politics during that time. And I kind of br brushed up because I, I kid you not at that age, two years ago, when I was like 33, I had no idea what left first right meant. Like I didn't know anything about like the mo modern political system. I knew a little bit of us history and the revolutionary war and whatever from you know school, but I didn't know anything about how any of it worked at all. And so I brushed up on that kind of came to some agreements of first principles with myself about how I want to think about the state, how I want to think about tyranny, how I want to think about freedom, how I want to think about all these things. And then Bitcoin was really the epicenter of all that, right? Because like at the time I had come into some money from an exit in a business I had. And I was like, okay, I had this cash, I have this US cash, but now like the, they're, do, they're doing all this money printing. And I see everybody talking about inflation. It's so like when I dived into that, I was like, okay, this is pretty crazy. So I thought of the cash in my bank account as this kind of melting ice cube. And I was like, I'm not okay with this money that took me 10 years of entrepreneurship to, to earn now just being stolen from me out of my bank account because the government decides to make more of it, right? That's kind of the simple way to think about inflation. It's like a taxation without legislation, mm -hmm. as Milton Friedman said. And so I came to the conclusion that I should buy gold, silver, and Bitcoin, right? My mistake though at the time, which is again, hindsight is 20-20, is I bought more gold and silver than I did Bitcoin because I was much more coming at the hard money from a hard metal perspective, which is what a lot of the gold bugs and the silver bugs are into. And they basically talk about everything Bitcoiners talk about, but their solution to the problem 
which is they think buy more gold and silver is not the actual solution to the problem that they think. It's kind of an outdated solution, whereas Bitcoin is the actual solution, right? So then I finally woke up in 2021, liquidated most of my gold and silver, have some silver because I like silver. And I still think it has a lot of industrial purposes. Like silver is an amazing thing. And I think you'll always find a way to liquidate if you need to. So it might be nice to have some silver coins in your pocket if the world ends. So I keep silver. And then I moved most of my uh, li liquid net worth into Bitcoin. Whereas I'm, I'm, you know, like I'm a full blown hardcore, like most of my, of what I own in this world is in Bitcoin. And so you could call me a maximalist. You could call me a true believer, whatever. Um, so that's where I got to today. And I just look at it as my long-term savings account, my long-term investment account, my bank account, like I'm my own bank. If I need a loan, I can take loans out against my Bitcoin. I can do things like that. And it's a way I've opted out in a way of the banking industry as much as I can. Cause I think the banking industry is one of those corrupt legacy institutions that just is like terrible for a reason because of regulation and the state can manipulating it and whatever. Uh, and that's where I am it at, at today. And where I believe Bitcoin is going is not just about whether it's going to be worth a million a coin or 5 million or whatever. Everyone's like wants to focus on how much it's going to be worth, but it's, it's about what it's going to do to change society as we know it. Right. When you can remove power of the state and their monopoly on violence and control, when they are disincentivized to commit violence towards you, because in the old day, if you had gold or silver or real estate or guns or tanks, or whatever, and you were conquered by a foe, they could take those resources from you, right? Which is since the dawn of time, humans have been fighting over oil, timber, like gold, whatever. Now with Bitcoin, you can't do that. You could conquer a people and you could never get their Bitcoin, right? If it was just stored in their head somewhere. Now there's ways to get it and there's ways to coerce it out of people, but it, it's not a guarantee, right? Whereas I know that if I invade Ukraine, for example, I can take Ukraine and all resources, it's mine. Right. Bitcoin is this metaphysical realm that you can't manipulate or control. And no state actor can ever um, control, manipulate, shut down anything. And what that does is it, it allows the individual like you or I to store our financial energy, our financial wealth in this place that is untouchable by government. And what that does is it brings a kind of equality and a kind of equal playing field to all eight billion humans, seven billion humans, whatever we have now. Right. Never before in the history we've been, we've been able to do that, right? And this is why it improves on gold like a thousandfold. And it's also why it's going to change property rights. It's going to change political organizing. It's going to change the entire future of humanity that people don't understand. I mean, like we're talking 1% of people that even own Bitcoin really understand how, how impactful it is. And it takes probably a hundred hours of deep study and thinking about it and dreaming about it, like having Bitcoin dreams as I've had. Like it takes that to really come to that, what I call Bitcoin epiphany, where you're like, this is going to change the world. This is as important as humans discovery of fire in the wheel. Right. And that's, that's how I feel about Bitcoin. Happy to answer any questions or take that wherever you want. Yeah. Uh, fire wheel and then bitcoin or mm -hmm. and also printing yeah. printing press the printing well, press printing was press also. was first right and that that mm -hmm. it's funny you mentioned that because printing press and bitcoin there's a lot of parallels because what happened with the printing press was the they were printing the gutenberg bible and the church thought it was going to help them spread christianity more because they were to get more bibles out and what it did is allowed for someone like martin luther to come in and say no, the church is BS. We don't have to follow what they say. We don't, we don't pay for salvation. Like you don't need their, their, their approval to be God loving or whatever. And it actually removed a lot of the power of the church, right? Same thing with Bitcoin, like, and even the internet, the internet was something that was actually created by the U S government, but they handed it off to the free market, which they didn't have to, but they did. Right. And maybe they thought it would bring economic prosperity, whatever. And it did bring economic prosperity for America, but at the same time, it brought a decentralizing of the power of America, because now people can communicate in real time and you can try to control the press all you want. And you can try to censor all you want. It still gets out and in the age of the internet, because it is a decentralized Hydra. When you censor one person, you actually create like three more heads that pop up like, like the Hydra. And right. So that's why censorship in the age of the internet doesn't work. It actually backfires. And so it's one of those things like the people that create the internet did not foresee that it would actually circumvent over time. We're talking like maybe in the next 50 to hundred years, the collapse of the per, the uh, government that created it, right? And then Bitcoin is like the next phase. That's like the final nail in the coffin. When we finally collapse their monopoly on the money printer, that's when you'll see the American empire fall. But you also see maybe not another American uh, empire rise, although China might be in contentious for that because they have such a consolidated like lack of human rights way of doing things that, that for a while they will be able to consolidate and centralize. And so, yeah, it's, it's just fascinating. Like the next 50 to 100 years are going to be 
really, really dicey. Uh, either way, though, I think it's going to be better. I think we're going through a we're going to go through a better phase, and it's going to be painful at times. And there's going to be pockets of violence. There's going to be pockets of unrest. But there will also be lots of safe areas. There'll be a lot of areas that will encourage people to come because they'll be providing better services, better privacy, better, you know, better um, Bitcoin pro whatever, right? So it's going to be interesting to say the least. Yeah, and internet, so maybe the pe people who who uh, want, just released it to the public, they didn't know what's going to happen with it. They had no idea. It yep. was a fire that took a, li uh, a life of its own. Uh, yes. Yep. And yeah, and it led to Bitcoin, which is really huge. It uh, came about in 2008 and it's really mind boggling what happened after that what people build up on that for example the lightning network they they always go about this the pro problem of a scalability and the lightning network just came over uh, was built uh, on it and made it even more divisible so we have we will have units smaller than satoshi and and faster in, and and without faster right without and like the they fees. basically the lightning network that you mentioned now that you mentioned it, has basically been able to surpass visa and the transactions per second it can actually accomplish wow so it's like we're already there right and it's just going to take time for people to understand this and more companies to adopt it and more individuals to adopt it but that's what it is you have base layer which is the hard money hardest money to ever exist which is bitcoin you, it's incorruptible infallible unchangeable and then you have other layers built on top just like visa is built on the us dollar Right. And then that's how we're going to circumvent Visa eventually is using some kind of maybe first, second and third, maybe even third layers. Right. Which are like built on top of built on top of built on top of the core thesis is if you have the core, you could say the settlement layer is what they call, it, which means Bitcoin is the area where you settle up so that as long as it's pegged to that, you always have mathematical certainty. Right. The, we had this on the gold standard for a long time, and we had some of the greatest prosperity in the history of the world during the times when we had the hardest money, which means we had money that was redeemable in gold which made it so that you couldn't just make more of it because if you made more of it, you would run out of gold, just like what happened with Nixon. The reason Nixon took the US off the gold standard was because it was like 60, it was 60, it was six to one claim. So the amount of US dollars in existence, and there was only like one of uh, one to six, so like, I don't know, was that 10%, 15% or something? They only had 15% gold, yet they had like 95% or 85% claim on dollars against it. So when countries started saying, I want my gold back, the US had to say, no, because we're going to run out of gold. And that's since then, you know, now that we have like fiat currencies, a completely different ballgame, but like that was how it started breaking down. Yeah. Yeah. And also what you mentioned about Bitcoin price and also, uh, and contrasted it with what it's going to bring. And that's a, the revolution that it's going to bring about. And that's the more important thing. And I think one of the most important argument when someone comes at you with, uh, this uh, line of re reasoning that if I buy uh, XYZ shitcoin, it's uh, $0.1. And if it grows tenfold, I will earn a lot and I don't have to invest a lot in it. But what matters is the change that Bitcoin is going to bring about, is going to facilitate. It is not, the price is important. It means it, it reflects uh, what people in the world collectively associate with it, mm -hmm. how and they adopt, view adoption. it. Mm -hmm. And how they adopt it, right. Exactly. How they adopt it, how much it is adopted, how popular mm -hmm. it is. And that's important. But the more important thing is the changes that it's going uh, to bring about. And uh, where you, I mean, uh, I got from your words that Bitcoin made you more optimistic, if I'm not wrong. Yep, you're right. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. In what ways did it change you? Did, did it make you more optimistic? Yeah. So there's some recent, there's a recent quote that comes to mind on that question. And it was something to the effect of, if we didn't have Bitcoin now, with where we are at with like the US dollar, the money printing, interest rates, like all the craziness of the Fed and their monopoly on the money printer. If we didn't have Bitcoin now, he basically said we'd be effed. Like we would become just, there would be like no hope, right? So it would be a very doom and gloom, like prep down in the woods because like stuff's going to probably all collapse type of scenario, right? But we have this thing through Bitcoin 
where if the US dollar does collapse and Bitcoin, let's say hyper parabolic in price, right? It's not even about the price that matters to me. It's that I believe it will help keep society from breaking down because we have a backup solution, right? Because the, this is what happens if the dollar collapses. People don't understand this. If the dollar collapses, we had no, no other solution. You don't get electricity. You don't get food. Literally everything around you breaks down because nobody is going to be able to commerce, right? And if you can't, if, if, if the electric company can't buy coal or timber or whatever they use to burn or, you know, or hire people to come man the dam or whatever it is, if there's no way to pay those people because there's no currency that matters and we're going to back to like trying to sh shave off bits of gold or silver, or like, like it will be a nightmare and it could take five to 10 years to come to some new standard and kind of fix itself, right? That will be a very painful five, 10 years. And a lot of people, especially living in urban environments that don't have extra food, water, like they, they rely on the grid, they rely on society, they rely on grocery stores. If that stuff breaks down, we're talking about millions of people dying. I, if we didn't have Bitcoin, I would be very pessimistic because I, I would foresee that as happening and there'd be no way around it, right? So that's, that's one piece. The other piece is like, we had the financial collapse in 2009, which was the impetus for Bitcoin's creation, right? And what it's fascinating because it was like exactly when it was needed. It was, it was, it was like Bitcoin showed up at the time in which this whole thing was going to come breaking down. And like, it's, it's really, you know, they call it immaculate conception. All these variables had to be in place, but also just the timing of it. Like it's, it's very fascinating, right? It's kind of like it's, it's evolution is what it is. It's evolution that happened because certain environmental factors came into place. And we tend to think of evolution as happening like with like other like animals and, and organisms and nature or whatever. But the reality is like we are evolving or evolution is happening through us. So for example, if you take AI, for example, like Elon's afraid of AI because he believes El we might be the bootloader for, for super intelligence and then super intelligence enslaves humanity. And I've thought about that. And I think he's actually right. I don't, necessarily think it's going to happen anytime soon because we just don't understand the brain. We don't understand consciousness the way people think. So it's not, it's not as easy as just like programming some code and then bam, there's super intelligence. But I think there's probably a point in the future where that can happen. And like, we'll be, we better be very careful on that because we might invent the thing that makes us extinct, right? Or we might invent the thing that turns us into cows, dogs, and sheep, which are domesticated animals, right? We might be the domesticated slaves for the AI, if you, just like matrix, basically, you know? So it's very fascinating. And I see Bitcoin as an evolutionary force that, again, like the discovery fire or the wheel, right? It was there somewhere. Nature just had to figure a way to find it. And so it makes me optimistic because Bitcoin is the ultimate leveler. It's the ultimate, um, it's the ultimate bringer of sovereignty and protection of personal property and personal wealth that, that has ever existed. And if we can get it in the hands of 7 billion humans, we effectively make the state go from having a monopoly on what the state has. Monopoly in an area has a monopoly on everything. If they say you're bad, they throw you in jail. They throw away the key. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, they do whatever they want. When you have a Bitcoin standard though, you have the sovereign individual thesis playing out, which is basically that states become like corporations and corporations are beholden to their shareholders and their customers, primarily their customers. Because if you don't have customers, you don't have shareholders, you don't have a corporation and you effectively lose control. Nobody shows up, nobody pays you or listens to you or whatever. And if we had more states and countries that operated like businesses that have products and services and that have to keep their customers happy, we would have pretty much as close to a utopia as you can have with human nature and technology and all these different things, right? So I'm optimistic that that's the future we're headed. I just don't know how bumpy it's going to be over the next like 20 to 50 years to get there. But Bitcoin is integral either way. Hmm. Yeah, and I uh, remember that uh, on your website, you had mentioned that property is natural law. Yep. You know, could you exp uh, uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, so the thing about property, and Ayn Rand's big on this, you like it's a universal law. So for example, the difference between, let's see here, like the difference between sex and rape, right, would be choice. One violates property law, the ultimate property law of your body, and one doesn't, right? And so you, when you get really deep and you think about the different examples of that, like people, especially with like the 2020 stuff and, and the mass mandates and the vaccines, you get people that are like, well, 
we should make exceptions to property rights. Like you should get this for the greater good and things like that. The problem is the greater good always slippery slope towards basically absolute tyranny for various reasons. It's just a violation of natural law, right? Which is why we, this is, I've also thought about this. The reason not um, Hitler didn't win, the reason you know Mao didn't win, the reason like we don't live in this totalitarian dystopia is because when you violate property rights over time, you lose because you're going against nature. Like it's the ultimate going against nature flow that you just simply will never win, right? So it's um, it's just the core, it's core. It's like, you have the right to your body. You have the right to your thoughts. You have right to things that you own and earn. And if you look at the history of civilization, whenever there's been prosperity, which has brought more human life, more happiness, more like less human death, less human suffering, like basically on every metric you can measure, when there is strong property rights, humanity does better. When there are weaker property rights, like in communism, socialism, fascism, whatever, you have the opposite. Everything is worse, not only in the economic production, but in the, um, you could say the laws, regulations, enforcement, you know, like pick winners and choosers. It's basically the most unnatural, lopsided, like cronyism. Like you just get all these distortions of life that when quantified are worse for humanity compared to free markets that have property rights, which is better. It's really a binary thing. The more freedom in free markets and the protection of property rights, the better humanity does, is, will be, and will continue to be. And on the flip side, the worse, right? Which is why actually the Amer America is declining now because we become basically a socialist um, superpower. Like, you know, like Obamacare, that was like a really big step in the wrong direction, but it's been going on for a while. And that's just one piece of the, puzzle that is the juggernaut that is america that is like just too big to control anymore it's like this ship that's kind of like lost its captain and it's just like you can't stop it and what what the politicians are trying to do is just like maybe steer it not off the cliff yet <laughs> like at least not while they're in office give it to the next guy he'll do it right it can't be stopped it will erode it's a violation of natural law because we violated property rights too often, too many times, especially with just inflation. That's like the number one violation because you steal out of my pocket and you don't, you're not even here. You don't even ask me, mm -hmm. you just take it. Right. So yeah, it's like, I, I guess I lost the question, but happy to take it from there where you, where you think we need to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we started with uh, property. Uh, and yeah. It's so many things connected. Yeah. So it's hard mm -hmm. to answer it. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, every bit of answer clarifies uh, the answer to another question. Mm -hmm. They are all uh, connected to one another. And uh, something that I am curious about, uh, were you ever interested in so uh, socialism or were you a socialist at some time? Did you have socialist leanings? <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. No, I, I never have. Though when I was younger, I remember during the Bush administration when we were going to war with Iraq. I mean, I was in high school, but like I remember having, you know, a bumper sticker of like, no to war in Iraq. And I was kind of like doing that thing. And I, I didn't know why I didn't, it just felt wrong to me. Like, and people, you know, you kind of see people spitting out like maybe why it's wrong, but I was too young. I wasn't really paying attention. I just kind of hopped on that. And I don't think that really makes me a socialist or anything like that leaning there at all. Um, and then I, I think a couple years after that, I tried asking somebody like, how do I know if I'm left or right? Or like, how do I know if I'm Democrat or Republican? Because I still had no conception of these things. And I'm actually happy. I'm happy I didn't pay attention to any of it because like it's it's literally a waste of time. The two party system is a joke. The state is a violation of property rights, which you, we've already established, like I believe this natural law. Right. So the state is an abomination. It is a violation of natural law. And so. I would probably say that like when you're younger and we see this, you tend to feel like you're more of a socialist because you believe in equality and you believe in like fairness and you believe in all these things. But when you're older, you understand human nature more. And that's why you tend to go more right. And you want to preserve things like, as they say, conservatives preserve or whatever. But for me, it's not even like conservative or liberal. It's just about whether it's property right and whether it's protected or is, is it not in the conservative the conservative list is more preserving of property rights, whereas the left is more violating of them, mm -hmm. right? They're both a violation of natural law because it's a two-party system and the state is corrupt and broken and whatever. But if I had to, if I was like leaning more towards one, it was, it's definitely more on, on the right side, right? But I don't identify as anything. I'm not politically affiliated. I, I'm basically a free market anarchist if you had to label it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's the best way to answer the question, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
Actually, I uh, I used to call myself identify um, as a as an anarchist, and at the same time, I was so interested in and so invested in uh, socialist ideas, and I thought that these things can go together. And thanks to Bitcoin, I discovered that you no, know, we can a free market and capitalism is not that dirty word, and actually that that mm-hmm. brings more prosperity. And that brings less control over people, over individuals' lives. And they become more uh, autonomous. They can decide for themselves. The government, as you explained about taxes, you are not even there, but you intervene in someone's life. You Mm -hmm. rob people's pocket. If they don't do the right thing, don't say the right thing, you can punish them. Uh, And yeah, so Bitcoin was a wake-up call for me that okay that is not that uh, dirty word and what you mentioned about uh, natural law actually property even among animals even if you look at the wild nature the property is something sacred among, among them something that they protect that's important to them so even uh, it is not a human invention it's Right. something in our actually in the wild nature we can even see that yeah that's actually a good point i i hadn't thought about it that way but if you think about it protection of your personal property means protecting yourself so that you can procreate and then protecting your offspring so your genes survive it is the ultimate property but all property stems from that right if i give my life force i give my energy think about it this way so i give my energy to produce something so like it takes me a year to build a business and it's making some money or whatever. I traded actual energy that I had to eat and acquire in some way, pay for whatever. Mm-hmm. I created this thing. And that's now just a manifestation of energy that's coming back to me that I have claim on that I own. That's no different than if I invest energy into raising my child, right? Or if I invest ener- like energy into my body, just like being alive, right? And so if you threaten, and this is why I take stuff very seriously, and this is why I'm also a proponent of gun rights and, and like basically unlimited property rights. Like, as long as I leave you alone, and I don't co- coerce you into doing anything you don't want to do. You do that to me, we can live in utopia, right? And you know that's in a way what nature is. Now people don't like that idea. They maybe think it's barbaric, right? But there's that's like a deep rabbit hole we can get into. And there's like there's like trade offs and pros and cons. But really, what you were getting at with with the um, socialism and like free markets and how they can combine. This is the irony of here. This is what's so crazy. It's almost a paradox. The ideas that make you be a socialist. You get if you have a truly free market and everybody opts in. But socialist as a political system is based on violating property rights to force some to do some things at the expense of others. And generally, it's just top down enforcement and it's hard to get in and out of your country and like maybe you're born there or whatever. So, like, those are all violations of property rights. Cause if it was like, okay, we're gonna be a socialist country, this is how we're gonna run it, but anybody can come and go. And the second you don't, agree with our, our rules or laws, you just leave and you go pay tax somewhere else, go do whatever. And that is the sovereign individual thesis. That's, that's basically government should compete for us based on the products and services they provide, right? So if we had it, so the whole world was a bunch of states, governments, whatever, and they were all competing for every global citizen as they should, because no country owns a human, no state owns a human. I don't care if they're born there or not, which again, a violation of property law. If we had that, then you could have a place that you might say, we're going to be more socialist so that if you come here, you pay 50% in taxes. But this is what you get for that. As long as that citizen can leave and go willingly, then it's actually not even really socialism. It's just a contract. It's just an agreement with a service provider. The problem with socialism is it is, again, it's based on like, we'll force you to pay a certain amount and then we'll dole it out the way we want or a small select group wants. And then we'll talk about how it's equality for all, even though it's really equality for like everybody that's not elite, right? So, or or it's equality for the elite, not everybody else. So the ideas that attract you to socialism are human ideals. It's, It's communism, it's communal sharing, you know, it's how humans evolved in the wild. We were small groups. Everybody thought the same. We shared resources. There was no, there was not even an idea of personal property. That's where it's funky here. And this is also why we get all the problems because we had a break from personal property with the advent of economies and money and things like that. And I think the world's better. I think it's, I think it's a necessary step in our evolution because if we lived still small tribes, like 
We wouldn't have iPhones. We wouldn't be doing a podcast right now. Like we wouldn't be evolving and getting to space and doing all the things that we're going to do, uh, you know, in the future, which is going to be amazing. Right. So we're going through this rough patch, of like 10 to 15,000 years. And then I think we're going to just like have massive abundance. Like when we can basically escape gravity on earth cost effectively, mine asteroids, colonize other planets, like the universe is big enough so everybody can live like rich kings for, for, for like hundreds of trillions of humans if we wanted to right so then you get into things like scarcity on earth and climate change and all these other things right it's all based on a scarcity mindset it's all all based on coercion which is a violation of property law instead if we said free market if you want to go to the state you go there this is what they do versus that state you make your decision we would actually have less human suffering more human abundance more child's being born and raised like less childbirth like everything would be better that's better that you want better and everything that would be worse or everything that is worse now would also get better maybe even eliminate completely right so like if you if you are a socialist you actually are a closet free market anarchist yet you don't really un realize it <laughs> <laughs> that was a funny way to put it yeah for, for me it was true actually <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, also, yeah, uh, this is like, for example, you go to a restaurant, you know that they use vegetable oils, they have crappy stuff, so you don't buy from them. Exactly. If you don't like that government, if you if they don't serve the things that you want, you go to another restaurant. 100%. If they, yeah, if they don't play the music, the bad music, or you don't want them to play music, uh, play any music in the background, you go to another restaurant that has those uh, features. There is more variety and maybe they converge on something, mm -hmm. but uh, they have to compete and they have to keep the customer satisfied. And that's the benefit. Um, I, yeah, and uh, I remember on your podcast with, um, with, with Kevin, uh, you, how did you interpret USA? United Socialists of America. Oh yeah, USSA, United Social States of America. <laughs> that's uh, that's what we are at this point. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was very funny for me because you know uh, I always thought of the US as a as this big capitalist uh, country, but you see that it is becoming the most coercive, centralized socialist uh, country in the whole world because of the massive power it has. Yep, it's going down that route so fast, and that's frightening, to be honest. Yeah, the one the one comment I'll make on that is that we still have state power, which is massive. If we didn't have states that were able to basically compete for customers, which is what we're talking about with this kind of sovereign individual thesis, it's in it's a sovereign individual thesis within the U.S. Right, I'm still a U.S. citizen, and I have to have a passport, and other countries won't just take me freely. So I'm still you could say constrained by the fact that I am a U.S. citizen and I still have to play like in this U.S. citizen game for the most part, unless I find a way out. And for, for me, like a way out would be, I'd have to buy property in the Caribbean or like basically pay a hundred grand to get a passport somewhere else. Like there's, you know, there's ways to do it, but that's still like a violation because now I got to come up with that money. I got to invest my energy into that and then do that just to escape, right? I got to like basically pay for my get out of jail free card, you know? The state power makes it so that Places like Florida and Texas, which are now basically considered like the freest places on the earth, on planet Earth right now, can put a flag in the ground, like draw a line, and say this is our line. If you value these things like freedom or you're, you're like pro Bitcoin, which they've been talking about things like that, then you come here. And as a result, the state will grow, the tax revenues will grow, um, everything in the area will grow, and the people will be better, healthier. Like they'll have more financial power, sovereignty, like more opportunity of choice. It just makes, like I said, everything better. It's not fully free. We still have things that are coerced, but it's like if we can get to a place where you go from California with like state income tax, you know, like you can't walk down the street without maybe getting mugged and like there's a lot of homeless everywhere. People don't like that. Like, if, like you go from a place like that to a place like Texas and your quality of life improves that drastically over a given enough period of time, California will collapse, right? New York. I mean, it, it, it probably will collapse. There's a lot of money there. So like, I don't know, it's tough. New York's a tough one because they, they have so much like wealth and, and, and just like a brand that they might be able to kind of get away with their mm -hmm. BS for a long time, right? But California, we've already seen, it's been off the hinges for who knows how long right now. And it's, gonna, it's only getting worse, right? And so that's why people are moving to Texas and Florida, the two fastest growing states in the country right now, right? So it's good that we have that because if we didn't have that, I think we would have, all these blanket, like we'd have blanket mandates, we'd have blanket this, blanket that, 
the government would further be intervening in markets, further messing things up. Like Biden right now is like messing with supply chains and saying truckers can't do this and do that. It's just unbelievable where these people get off thinking they could do that. But again, it's like they don't have skin in the game. They get paid. And whether they're successful or not, they'll just retire somewhere wealthy and get paid 250 grand for speaking engagements. Like the entire system is, is broken. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, what uh, Winston Churchill said. He said that democ or maybe it was maybe it was Benjamin Franklin, but it was some, something like democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other. I think it was like Churchill. Ma yeah, Churchill. Yeah. It's like democracy is the worst form of the government, except for all the others. Right. Hmm. That's also before we had a Bitcoin standard. Right. That's before we could exactly. have something like free private cities and we could have this sovereign individual thesis play out. And we already see the Internet doing this is dematerializing so much of the of the real world and so much of the traditional wealth that you had to like guard with men with guns now is moving into the metaphysical realm that is the Internet, which is going to make it so that humans are more able to be sovereign individuals. I can go anywhere in the world right now. I can go with a seed phrase in my head or I can have like two factors set up and I can own my wealth in a place that the government doesn't even know exists. That's powerful stuff. And what that does is it brings a leveling of the playing field so that states have less power and control and they have to act better as a result. Yeah, and this dematerialization is really big. And that's what, actually what makes silver and gold not a very good solution for- Not anymore, what, right? Yeah, not anymore. Because they're because highly- concentrated they're manipulated the big banks can they i mean they've been suppressing the price of gold and silver for years now like mm -hmm. jp morgan had a billion That's dollar fine or something like it's just unbelievable and they'll keep on doing it you know and so there's just too many ways to manipulate they're not truly decentralized forms of money and that's why they failed yeah and because they are big you cannot just hide them, but the seed phrase you can hide it in your yes right brain. so well that's where the threat of violence comes in like you can't, you can't move large amounts of gold or silver if you have real wealth. It's, it's implausible. It's very expensive. You have to hire armed guards. Like it's massive amount of money to do that. And it makes you a target, right? Which is why governments have always prioritized controlling it, hoarding it, and manipulating it. And then convincing the public that it's not money anymore so that they can continue with their fiat Ponzi scheme. The thing is, though, they did not account for Bitcoin, which is like mm. what it's basically like gold into the metaphysical realm, just numbers, like, and we take all the best properties of gold and take those, get rid of all the worst properties of gold, and then have something that moves at the speed of light that you can't change. Yeah. Revolutionary. Yeah, definitely. Um, so thinking, uh, talking about the things governments do these days, maybe it's a good uh, point to shift our focus to conspiracy theory. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Conspir conspiracy theories and i saw some of your videos on that um they were pretty much interesting could you elaborate on them uh, here too yeah so you can look back and go to play, go to google and basically type in conspiracy theories that came true that's one way right the other thing to understand about conspiring and conspiracies itself people don't understand the word and this is where socrates is big on Socrates wanted you to define the words you were using because when he was, you know, debating with you or arguing with you, he had to get on the same page as you because if he doesn't understand what you mean by this word, how can he offer a retort or ask the right questions? Okay. Conspiring is something I do every day of my life. I wake up and I conspire to make money. I conspire to protect my family. I conspire with my partner to do certain things about our future and make certain investments and think a certain way and buy certain things, et cetera. Right. So I'm conspiring every day of my life to do things. All cons conspiracy is, is people coming together and deciding to do something. Okay, let's just like establish that as a baseline real quick, right? Because people think the idea of conspiracy is like, it's gotta be some like elite shadowy figure. And like, it's gotta be like this G2 country or politician with this reptiles. guy, or whatever. It's like, it, yeah, or like reptile men or whatever. And it's like, no, that's not what it, it might be that. It could be that, but that's not what it means, right? A conspiracy is just people coming together and sometimes they're very, uh, they're very accidental conspiracies, is actually what I call them. So if you have like FDA, if you have big food, if you have the US government subsidizing corn, wheat, and soy, and you have these things that just happen over time for various reasons, and they kind of come together to create processed food that then supports big pharma, and then big pharma starts making a lot of money, so they fund food research, and then the food researchers get money, and they support big food. And it's like this big, basically big circle jerk of everybody helping everyone else. It's like, that was a conspiracy that came together 
by just random forces that converged. And now they have a status quo bias, right? Mm -hmm. That's all almost anything is in the modern world. That's a status quo. It's just like all these different forces that have come together, established an equilibrium. You have some that benefit from it. You have some that don't, and you have some that don't really care. And then like to, to, to unseat that power in that status quo just takes so much energy and time and like revolution in some cases, right? So conspiracies, a lot of times are not these purposeful driven planned things where like, we're like, let's just create uh, big food and like put all these seed oils and foods, make people really fat and sick. And then we'll, our big pharma buddies will like capitalize on it and they'll give us some money back. It's like, nobody could have thought that. <laughs> it just happened that after World War II, we were the top producer in the world for a lot of things, manufacturing, whatever. We didn't have any war on our, our uh, shores, right? So we were like in a really good spot after World War II. And we became the global superpower that managed the world's money that produced a lot of the world's things, strong manufacturing. And we started growing a lot of food. We had a big population boom. Baby boomers came back and had a bunch of babies. And we became this economic superpower, right? And then as a result of that, after World War II, the other thing is that uh, the government was afraid about food. That's actually why they subsidized corn, wheat, and soy, because they were afraid we weren't gonna be able to feed our growing population. So what, they're, did, what they did is they basically said, hey, farmers, grow these crops so that we can make very cheap food in large quantities, and we'll pay you money. And then that eventually just solidified into permanent, permanent, permanency. And now we have, you know, corn, wheat, and soy being the foundation of the broken food system that leads to obesity and all the problems that then are supported by big pharma and everybody's all making money. Everyone's all propped up by the government. It's all, you know, it's all a accidental conspiracy. It's like, cause nobody planned it ahead of time. It's just things happened. And then people took advantage of them, right? Now, some conspiracies, legit happen. Like if you wanted to, I'm not saying this is what happened. Cause I don't know. I haven't dived into it enough. And I don't think anybody's going to know like really for sure. But if you wanted to fly a plane into the world trade center, like somebody had to plan that. Okay. So somebody planned it. Yes. Somebody funded it. Yes. Somebody made a bunch of money in the stock market by shorting the stocks. Yes. Mm -hmm. We already know that's on record. The question would be then was it a U.S. official or was it just like, you know, somebody over in the middle East, which is what the convenient narrative is. Who knows, right? Maybe it was the CIA. Maybe it was like one lone operative in the CIA that just went bonkers. Who the hell knows, right? But we know for sure that there was a conspiracy to commit 9-11 because they planned it and then they committed it. <laughs> Everything else is conjecture and it's maybe, it's possible, right? And I think where people get into the problem with these things is when they claim that they know for sure, even if there's a lot of data to support it, we just don't know most things for sure. But what you can do is you suspend your certainty and you ask yourself, would this make sense? Would the Bush family benefit? You know, would like, like would the Saudis benefit? Like maybe it was just one lone dude. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was, this was like a geopolitical master chess move to be able to go to war in Iraq. Who the frick knows? But I see how it could happen. And to entertain the idea that it could happen does not mean you're conspiracy theorists. It means you're pragmatic. You're prag, what is it? Pragmatic, pragmatical? You're pragmatic. You're, you're a pragmatist. That's the word. You're a pragmatist. People, humans, this is, our, this is what we struggle with. We struggle with black and white binary thinking. We want everything to be good, bad, evil, not like, you know, good. Uh, what's the opposite of evil? I guess like angel, angel, demon. I don't know what the opposite of evil is actually. Uh, that's, good. That's, an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting thought that popped in my head, but like evil, not evil, right? Good, mm -hmm. bad, black, white, you know? We want to create these either or binary heuristics in our mind because that saves us energy so we don't have to think very hard and what people don't understand about human biology is when you were in the wild if you spend a lot of time thinking like sitting by a tree i'm just going to think all day and i'm going to burn off like 20 percent of my calories just for my brain you would die very quickly because you had to be out expending calories to find food and to protect your offspring and to have sex and do all these things right so we are disincentivized to spend too much time thinking which is why most people don't want to think they want to be told what to think and they want to accept convenient narratives because i mean it sounds like it makes sense and all my friends think it's the case okay right it is so that's not, my take on conspiracies <laughs> yeah it is not very convenient sometimes it makes life uh, so hard what's ha happening these days is it, is it easy to get a job every three months uh, or every six months is it easy to uh, mask everywhere you go these are not well, easy for some people well, that's things. So that's where we got to understand the trade-offs. So some people, it is easier to do that, right? Mm. Because- Fear, it, maybe? Well, 
yes, but it's also like, is it easier to trust my government mm -hmm. or is it easier to like question everything? Mm -hmm. Is it easier to think what everyone else around me thinks and do what they're doing? Or is it easier to go against the grain? I mean, I, I, I was kicked out of three coffee shops the other day, not really kicked out, but I couldn't buy from them because they refused to serve me because I didn't have a mask. Even in Austin, Texas, like, I guess they changed the, the level of warning, or whatever. The mayor here is a complete moron. Our governor's good, but the moron, the, the moron that's mayoring Austin is like left-leaning, like mask, everything, complete utter moron. And so a lot of small businesses will just follow their lead and do what's easy, right? For me, it would be easier to put a mask on. Like, oh, I literally put on my face, take it off. No, no problem, right? But I have, it just violates my principles so much that I refuse to do it. And I won't support businesses that demand it. I support, again, freedom. And if you don't want my business, and if you want to have mask mandates and risk going out of business, then that's your choice. I, like, I can't tell you not to do that. I think it's stupid from an economics perspective. And I think, it's, I think it's stupid for a lot of other reasons, but it's your business. You can do what you want. So yeah, I mean, I don't think it's easier to really challenge the status quo. I don't think it's easier to stand out. I don't think it's easier to, to, to think for yourself. I don't think it's easier, easier to even think deeply about things and like do hundreds of hours of research when most people like they go to work, they're tired all the time. They're eating crappy food. They don't get a lot mm -hmm. of sleep. And then the rest of the time they're on social media, like just looking for the next dopamine hit. Like for those people doing any of the things that you and I are talking about studying, going deep, asking deep questions, like challenging their friends, challenging their family. That's not easy at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually food is a big thing here. When you uh, eat well, you think better. And actually, when you know what eating well is, and you realize that everything was a lie, almost everything, oh, yeah. yep. then that's a moment of awakening. What else is a lie? What else is a lie? Is this a lie too? Well, it looks like that. The paradigm is like that. The pattern is like that. And you see it, you recognize it, and you yep. choose not to obey it. Which brings us to this point, when... When, which one come, came first? I think Bitcoin came first for you and then carnivore came or carnivore came. And then uh, well, Bitcoin? I mean, speaking of nutrition and what you just said, my first, you could say red pill awakening was nutrition. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah. that was kind of the standard American diet. It was like the paleo diet. It was, it was about quality versus quantity. Everyone told you count calories and that didn't really do it. You know, and then I saw, I got into paleo and it was like, well, food quality matters and maybe also pay attention to your carbs, right? And so I started doing that and I got all the results I ever wanted. And then I started looking into like, what does the science, like the science say here? And then I started looking into, you know, big food, big pharma research. Like basically it pulled back the veil of how everything is broken. Like if it's mainstream, it's broken. If it's mainstream, it has flawed incentives that make it so that truth is hidden either on purpose or on accident. And, and for me, that was like the first opening of like, wow, you should challenge everything, especially quote unquote, experts, doctors, scientists, epidemiologists, people that get paid by the government or have some incentive to please them. These are the people you should challenge the most because they're operating at a place from politics first, generally, because they want to protect their job or their status. And they're, and they're not operating from a place of truth first. Most people think of scientists or doctors as truth seeking. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are humans that have a incentive model. They have income. They have livelihoods. They got bills. They have worries. They have stresses. And they have perceptual bias, just like every other human. And so- mm -hmm. That was a big awakening for me. Carnivore was like an, a step in that evolution of like, well, you know, this is interesting. If I look at some of the data, if I think about my own life, if I think about what foods make me feel the best, what don't, whatever, uh, and I want to kind of lean up for a bit and try something new, makes total sense. Mm -hmm. So happy to go from there. I got I got 10 minutes and I got to hop off, but we can kind of explore carnivore uh -huh. a little bit and then we can always do a round two. I don't mind. Okay, so that, that's great. So since we haven't got much time, we talked about The Sovereign Individual, and that's one of the books that I recently finished. And the beautiful thing about the Bitcoin community is, not, is that it is not just the Bitcoin, not holding Bitcoin, it is not just Bitcoin uh, price. It's also the books, <laughs> the people that you meet, the, the yep. kind of things that they talk about. Uh, what other book recommendations do you have? Hmm. So if I'm thinking about Bitcoin. Anything, it doesn't have to be about yeah. Bitcoin or anything. 
Yeah, I, I, I want to, I'll start with a couple related to Bitcoin, what we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book called Free Private Cities. That's good. Anything about libertarianism mm -hmm. is probably pretty good. Um, agorism is actually really big. So Michael, or I think it was Scott Konkin or Michael Konkin, I forgot his name, but he wrote the Libertarian Manifesto, which you can find for free mm -hmm. online. I highly recommend that. He's probably my favorite thinker as far as political systems go. And he was a big proponent of creating decentralized economies. He called them counter economies that were basically outside the purview of the state. And as a means of doing that, you would starve the state of resources because you would take this thing that they capture tax revenue from through and move it to a place where they can't capture tax revenue. And a lot of ways, that's what Bitcoin, you know, enables, right? Exactly. This is before he even had that. So it's like really revolutionary that he was thinking about these things in like the 70s. So that's a good one to read. Um, I would read Sapiens for sure. Uh, the story of the human body is good. Anything along evolutionary biology and psychology. I mean, I, I say anything, like there's some good and bad in there, but like just read it all to get an understanding of it. Because when you really understand human nature, you're like, holy crap, the, the world makes so much sense. <laughs> and and how, how broken it is makes so much sense. So those for sure, Ayn Rand, I would recommend Atlas Shrug, and I would recommend The Fountainhead. And I think she had one more of the novels that she did that was pretty good. And she's got a bunch of other essays and books you can read on about her. I didn't find much value in some of those other ones, but definitely uh, Atlas Shrug was very good. And then I would just read a lot of philosophy, a lot of stoicism, you know, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a big mm -hmm. one. Nietzsche is somebody that you can't really read directly though, unless you're like a philosophy person or you like understand German because, you know, the style, the translation, the flowery long prose, it's hard to follow. Some people can do that. It's not my cup of tea. I like very modern, simple language in my reading. And so mm -hmm. for me, Nietzsche was somebody that I studied through podcasts and YouTube videos and articles. Mm -hmm. So read about Nietzsche's ideas, read about the overman concept, read about the three part metamorphosis of going from the camel to the lion, to the child. It's like the most, it's basically Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and what Nietzsche believed mm -hmm. every human needed to come to because we are all indoctrinated by society. And if we want to ever truly overcome nihilism and become our own human, we have to let go of everything from society, everything we think we know. You have to, in one loud roar, be the lion and say, no, sacred, no, he called it. And then you're born again as a child. And from that childlike state of play and ignorance, you build a new meaning for yourself and a new identity. And you like can truly, for the first time in your life, see and think for yourself. To me, it's kind of like, how I think about how I want to be in my life and what I'm striving for. It's basically my own version of my, the overman, as he called it, or the Superman concept. It basically just means overcome human biology and human society and see truth and build better meaning and be better than all of that base primal nonsense. Right. Mm -hmm. So like Nietzsche is huge, was huge for me, but like I said, you got to kind of study him through other people. Uh, yeah. The books, true. Are, the books are hard to get through. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I have, try to go through the book and i have only i always quit i know i was give up <laughs> yeah. one hour of the audiobook and that was enough <laughs> yeah 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 but it, it is only 10 hours of audiobook so uh, manageable i think i can do that so before we uh before i let you go could you um uh, let us know where people can uh, follow you follow, follow your stuff yeah the best place is the betterhuman.co and that's where you can also hop on the newsletter that I send out twice a week. That'll also have the podcast there, the Better Human Podcast, and I'm on YouTube. So if you get me in the podcast app or on YouTube, you'll find me there. I'm doing about a video a day, a few a week, and it's always some combination of you know mindset. Every so often, I'll talk maybe like about a current event and politics, but I don't really spend a lot of time there. I spend most of my time around these big ideas, around how to become a better human, how to how to think for yourself, how to you know, break free from caring what other people think, how to, how to just be effective. Sometimes I even cover like how to actually be productive and get things done, you know, but really mm -hmm. it, it's definitely around mindset and identity and living as a modern human to be better, better than your previous self. And it's not like I got to be better than other people. What I want people to actually do is to overcome that instinct. I don't want you to try to be better than anybody other than your previous self. I want you to be better because you can give more of your gifts to the world and make the world a better place not because you can feel good about yourself. I want you to actually let go of the ego completely, right? I want you to become so much better that you don't even care that you're better, right? I want you to become better than caring about becoming better, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's a lifelong thing and it, it's not easy by any means, but I just feel like life is so short and we have so much we can do that. And people, and people are struggling so much that people really do need to step 
outside of their paradigm of looking in the world around them, stop taking cues from a broken world and start going inside, build that meaning from inside. Cause that's the only place you can find truth. Like you, you can only find truth through yourself. Nobody can give you truth. I can't plug you into a matrix and upload truth. I can't point to truth and say, there's truth. You have to see it through yourself only when your eyes are open to seeing it. And even getting to the point where your eyes can be open to seeing truth could be like a multi-year process. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Colin. So this is great. Yeah, this was great. Uh, great. Uh, I, I, I'm really gr grateful for the time that you gave us. And I, I really like your energy. Uh, and when I read your newsletter, your voice comes in, into my mind and it is mm, I, 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 it yeah. has the same kind of tone and yeah, yeah, volume. That. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Colin Stuckert. So have a great day. And you too, man. Yeah. Uh, see you maybe uh, soon, hopefully, and we can plan another podcast together. We'll do it. Yeah. We'll do it. Cool, yeah. man. All right. Thank see you. Ya. Bye.